Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Live with SNWS. I'm your National Ambassador, Matt Bailey. Uh, I like to go as live as often as possible. I realize I haven't been live much in the last week uh, or even two weeks, really, because a lot going on. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, meetings in, with the UK um, with a lot of people and catching up with a lot of people about a lot of things happening. Alex Dahlenberg says maths is about to start. Uh, married at first sight. I, I can't believe I even know what that acronym is, though I, I learned that acronym from Friendly Geordies, who I sometimes watch, who did those whole series of videos on maths. So um, that's a nice tangent. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm sorry if maths is about to start. This is kind of more and um, looking after yourself because uh, I know you've had a bit of a um, bit of knee work done, if I'm not correct. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not correct. <clears throat> Um, malt at first sight. <laughs> that's what that's what maths really should be called. Malt at first sight. Uh, they, they, that can work. That can work. Whiskey is my jam, aka Mark T. Good to see you, mate. Hope you're well. Thank you, everyone, for jumping in with me. This image that I've got at um on my uh, on my screen here uh, is, of course, Distillery One Forty Five. Now it's going to be impossible to talk about this distillery without actually talking about this distillery. This is, of course, Smogan Distillery. Now. I want to first stop, start by saying that you're watching an SMWS Scotch Malt Whiskey Society stream. I'm wearing an Abelauer t-shirt, so I'm not even in society t-shirt, and uh, we're talking about a Swedish whiskey. So sort of everything's a bit mishmash, which is kind of a bit of fun because we can have a bit of a chat about some of these things and um, have a bit of fun with it. Why not? It feels like Monday, doesn't it? But it's actually Tuesday. Normally because I do do a live on Monday, I didn't last night. I have here a bottle of 145.1. A sweet kiss from a smoking mermaid. Now, I first want to say, A, I am not going to apologize for getting any of the names wrong, of saying Swedish words wrong. I don't speak Swedish. I can't even pretend to do the Swedish accent correctly. You're not going to get that out of me. Um, however, I'm going to try my hardest to get some of the pronunciations right of some of the things that are to do with this distillery. This is, of course, Schmogen. Schmogen? Smogen Distillery. I'm going to say Smogen. I didn't see an H in it. S-M-O-G-E-N. Um, distilled 11th of August, 2011, region Sweden, first fill X bourbon barrel. Now, the reason why this is a fascinating whiskey to feature is a couple of reasons, because this is a, uh, this is basically what we call a new world, uh, a new world whiskey. Uh, please try the accent. <laughs> uh, I appreciate you uh, giving that a go, but I don't like your chances. How about a Swedish chef impression? Jesse, uh, <laughs> I don't have that either. I, I just have my voice. You know what? Here's the, here's the joke in all of this. It takes scotch whisk. I'm going to have a talk. I'm going I'm to pour this first. Let this open up into the glass. I'm using a spirits glass because I can't find any of my whiskey glasses, my society whiskey glasses. They're somewhere in here. And I'm just going to pour just a small dram of that. Um, this is... Uh, it takes uh, scotch whiskey nerds years to often get the names of scotch whiskey distilleries correct let's be honest i still hear whiskey drinkers say glen moray when it's glen murray i he still hear brooch Ladditch. i still hear lafoy i still hear glen garioch they're all wrong of course it's glen geary it's glen murray it's brook laddie it's lafroig so these saying you know getting the names of scotch whiskey distilleries can take years to get right and people say them wrong still all the time and that's fine um it's not really fine, but it, it's it's fine because you we're in the process of learning as we go, and um, I don't want to bump that cable out. Uh, we're in the process of learning as we go, and I might not be saying smogen right. I might be smogen. It might be smogen. It might be smogen. Ardberg is a good example. I still hear Ardberg. Like I, I understand people getting Glen Geary wrong, for instance, because you look at it. It says Glen Garioch is 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 how you'd think to say it. However, you know, getting Glenn, getting um, Ard Berg wrong is inexcusable, really. Um, uh, you know what? I could rewind to 2014, I think. Might have been 13, 14, somewhere around there. Or maybe even been 2015. Anyway, there was a presentation being done in Australia, and one of the representatives for Ard Beg said Ard Berg in front of a group of people. That's just odd. Anyway. Um, is there a dramatic difference between the spirits glass and, Glen and the Glen can for the nosing? Jesse it is quite a bit more concentrated, the spirits glass, in terms of the aperture on the top and the, and the smallness of the bulb at the bottom. So, therefore, yes, it will be a subtle difference. I am not a huge fan of the Glen can for whiskey 
nosing and assessment. I'll be honest. I love the Glen Can for whiskey drinking, uh, for enjoyment. Uh, in terms of spirit assessment, I like to use something a little bit that looks a little bit closer to what we we present. Uh, there's lots of other stemmed and interesting whiskey glassware that is really good for for this. I've I've talked a bit about this before in previous live streams. The difference between whiskey drinking and enjoyment, and uh, whiskey appreciation and uh, assessment, and that th there's different glassware for both. Uh, and sometimes you'll find a little bit of crossover. The Glen Ken does cross over a little bit, but I really am not a fan of it when it comes to assessment and appreciation. I'm a fan of it for, uh, what's the word for it? Drinking and uh, enjoyment. So um, so this is the glass I'm going to use for tonight. This is the whiskey we're drinking. It is from Distillery 145. It's the dot one from this distillery. We still have some on the website. It's a lightly peated new old whiskey called A Sweet Kiss from a Smoking Mermaid, eight years old. And I just want to re first remark on the fact that it's an eight-year-old whiskey from a new old distillery. This distillery was founded in 2009 by an absolute whiskey enthusiast named Pa Caldenby. I'm probably saying his name wrong. It could be Pear, Pear Caldenby, or it could be Pa. I'm going to go with Pear, probably Pear. Um, Pear Caldenby uh, started the distillery in 2009 thanks to a very generous grant from the Swedish government of about a million kroner at the time, which I remember doing the maths for. If someone wants to find out what, how much that is in Australian dollars, what's a million kroner worth? Uh, it was maybe something like three or $400,000. So it was a lot of money at the time. Um, and he was given this money to set up this distillery. It has a, from it's, uh, yeah, 2009. Pear Caldenby's history is he's extremely um, a massive malt whiskey nerd. He owned a cask of Port Charlotte. He hosted tastings. He was a massive enthusiast of, of, um, of the spirit. So much so, uh, I'll come back to some of these slides in a moment. Really low resolution photo on your screen right now. This is Enjoying Malt Whiskey, the first refill edition. That's quite cute. By Pear Caldenby. Pear, Pear Caldenby. Someone just will have to get me on that one. Um, the why, what, when, and how of malt whiskey. And there's a tiny little photo of him on the screen of, of um, him enjoying uh, his cask of Port Charlotte there. Yes, uh, a smorgasbord board of options. Absolute, a smogus, <laughs> smogus board of options. Okay, that's a very cool comment. Well done. A smogus board of options, yeah. Uh, Jesse, you're very welcome. Um, Ryan Marshman says, just get something with the narrow lip and the Glen Can. Pour the same volume into both. Close your eyes and get someone to waft both under your schnoz. That's a really good advice. That's just that's just solid advice there for um, objective assessment of which glass you enjoy the most. But I still maintain you should keep a separation between in whiskeys, glassware you enjoy out of and whiskey that you can, and glassware that you assess out of. Uh, I would use this kind of glassware for assessment, but bordering into enjoyment, of course. And a Glen Can I would use for enjoyment, bordering into assessment. Whereas some glassware like um, like a Denver and Lily tumbler, great glass, uh, really good for enjoyment. And if you're going to want something that feels like you're holding a tumbler, that's a great glass, great option. Darren, hope you're in the team. Well, look, hope you're well as well, as well Darren. Great to see you again. And Jesse has done the has done the exchange for me. Thank you very much. One hundred and fifty two thousand five hundred Australian dollars. Yes. So that was the grant. Uh, Pear Caldenby was given to start Smoking Distillery back in two thousand and nine. Uh, so it's uh, it started producing in two thousand and ten. Was the first time the spirit ran, and um, it's located. The distillery itself is located on the west coast of Sweden uh, on a farm uh, near Hannes Bostrand. I've been told uh, Hannes Hanna Bostr uh, Bostrand. Sorry, Hannes Bostrand. Uh, it kind of like looks like a little sort of lazy fishing village in size. There we go. That's what it looks like. I, I don't know anything about the area. I've not been. It'd be a bit like me talking about Abelau without having, having ever having visited. I think you do need to visit these places to properly talk about the towns and the people and the distilleries around them. I've been to Abelau three times and it's um, way less than our cellar master, of course. But it, just going to these places and actually uh, experiencing and seeing what they do is fantastic. Um, been loving the outturn drams. Yes, thank you so much, Darren. Always good stuff from February outturn, which was including this one. Now I just didn't get a chance to really talk about it in the lead up to our February outturn, but the good news is there are some left, so that's why I'm talking about it a bit tonight. I've poured it into the glass about five minutes ago. It's a lightly peated New World Dot One whiskey. You know, it's uh, whenever you nose peated whiskies that aren't from Isla. That's the first thing that always like just goes boom. That's something a bit different straight away. And then you sort of uh, you start to identify what kind of peat we're talking about here. We're we talking about that sort of ashy, boggy kind of peat. 
No, we're not. Not at all. We're talking about that sort of almost dry, uh, like a dry Riesling almost type, type of heat. A lot of complexity in that. It's also quite old for this distillery. I mean, if we're talking distillery that opened in 2010 and it's 20, 2021 now. This is in some of the early runs of their spirit and it's from a first fill ex bourbon barrel as well. So lots of activity from the cask. It says on the front label, washed up seaweed, the gusty wind carrying aromas of smoked seafood whilst beachcombing. Diluted, we celebrated the longest day, love, life and love. There you go. A very romantic uh, tasting on the front bottle. The full tasting note, it says on the, um, in, in from, from our action, it says, we imagine beachcombing, exploring rock pools as briny waves washed up on fresh seaweed and the gusty wind carried aromas of smoked fish, prawns and other seafood from the nearby pier. Uh, clambering on the pier, we tried the food, which had an intriguing, sweet, salty, and lightly smoky flavor, which we found hard to describe. So let's get poetic. And then it goes into a bit more poetry and says it's a bit like being on a beach with plenty of dancing and singing to celebrate the longest uh, day of the year. So it's kind of like it's 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 one of those whiskies there where the peat is is quite indescribable from anything I've ever noticed before. It's light. Um, and um, oh, Ryan tell, tells me, okay, uh, par is pronounced par. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Uh, how many kinds of peat are there? Are we talking in the dozens of varieties, the hundreds? We're probably talking um, realistically probably in the hundreds, Jesse, but um, the types of peat vary uh, on the, I guess, the the layout of the land and the history of the land and the, it's peat, it, uh, peat is prepubescent coal. I don't know enough about the peat in Sweden. I know that he does source it locally. And it, I mean, it's very much, I mean, Swedish whiskey distilleries were, let's be honest, were unknown 10 years ago. So to taste something that's nearly you know, 10 years old, like an eight-year-old first fill. Oh, and, and when I first opened this bottle, I remember being like intrigued by it, but I didn't overly enjoy it the first time. I'm really enjoying it now. Maybe it just needed a bit more time, an open bottle effect, I guess. I'm not sure whether to um I'm not sure whether to uh, believe Ryan. I mean, Ryan, you do like to yank my chain a bit, so smoogin is smoogin. Oh, maybe it is smoogin. It could be smoogin. Maybe you're not yanking my chain. Maybe it is actually smoogin. Uh, smoogin, then we'll call it smoogin. <sighs> yeah, definitely that sweet seafood, like uh prawns wrapped in bacon. Yeah, okay, well, Ryan, I knew someone was going to bring that up. Mac Mira would, would tend to disagree with him. Yes, Mac Mira has been doing it a lot longer, but uh, outside of even like outside of even Sweden and Europe, I should say, I mean, outside of Sweden and Scandinavia, you wouldn't really sort of, um, uh, you know, wasn't it didn't have much of a notoriety. It didn't have much of a reach in the, into the you know US or Australia or New Zealand or anything like that. So, um. Okay, I, you, uh, you're not yanking my chain. I, I believe you now. There you go. Now, Keenan asks, great question, Keenan, and good to see you. Uh, what's the PPM on this gem? Now, we, we use a flavor profiling approach, as you know. In the peated categories, we sort of have oily and coastal, which is that sort of oily and coastal kind of drams, which are peated. Um, and then you'll have lightly peated, peated, and heavily peated. This one falls into the lightly peated category, and very rightly so. Um, we don't know the PPM on it. If we do, we haven't printed it. Um, it's because... Um, it you know we don't we don't see that PPM because a PPM is not a, a useful measurement. And I, I hate to say that, and some people are going to disagree with me on that, and that's fine. But when you see a whiskey that proudly promotes that it's 142 PPM or 65 PPM, what does that tell you? It doesn't actually tell you how peated the whiskey is. I know that sounds like a strange thing to say, but it really doesn't because they're, they're, I guarantee you, you've tasted whiskeys that are 55 PPM that taste peatier than whiskies that are 120 ppm or 240 ppm. Th those numbers, those parts per million of the peat measurement uh, also varies from distillery to distillery. Some will measure at the peat source. Some will measure on the spirit. So, um, yeah. Nonsense, it was here over a decade ago. Yeah, okay, maybe a couple of, like, indie retailers used to direct import it. But, yeah, anyway. Jesse says, uh, sort of comparable to barley, then too many factors to categorize. Well, barley has a – the difference is, however, Jesse, is that the factors on barley and the research into grain is quite exhaustive, and there are people who obviously dedicate their lives to this. I want to do a full live stream on barley coming up, actually, so still working on it. Um, and bubblegum Esther thing, yeah. And Ryan also says PPM is like IBU. 
Uh, fucking irrelevant. Yeah, it is. When you see these beers, these hoppy beers, I've often get, and Ryan's, you heard me say this before, um, in beer uh, and, and whiskey, here's a relationship, you see. Uh, it's all, it is a pissing, it turns into an absolute pissing competition uh, for the biggest number that you can print on the can or in the bottle. And it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't tell you anything about the spirit. And just as the, and it becomes this war of sort of escalating massive flavors that don't really um, help. And so you end up with this instance of where you've got, as, as, I, as I said, you've got, you've got PPM, which doesn't tell you anything about uh, the whiskey. You can have PPM. You could have whiskeys. I've had whis I have had whiskeys that are 55 PPM that taste peatier than 300 PPM spirit. So that measurement is just, a, it's a marketing pissing point. It's not really, sorry, Keenan, I'm not going after you, by the way. It's just one of those things like it's, it's I'm very passionate about because it becomes one of those things like who can make the peatiest whiskey? It's like, who can make the hoppiest beer? It doesn't mean it's a good beer. And that's why some of these super heavily peated whiskeys we see in core range bottlings, and I know that's really, uh, uh, you know which whiskeys I'm talking about, surely, um, uh, aren't very, um, they're often not very good. They're often completely one-dimensional. It's like if I just want to taste a peat ember, I just put a peat, I just put peat in my mouth uh, rather than actually, you know, spending a lot of money on a um, something that is just all for gimmick. Just like these beers, like these quadruple IPAs and 12 druple IPAs where it's the beer is just, it's just hops and it's just wet, wet, wet hops in your mouth. And it's like, uh, missing any malt character, missing any complexity, missing any finish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> get Daddenberg for Barley Mark II. <laughs> ah, yes. Daddenberg on round table. That was a lot of fun. Um, he, he, Ryan, Rake makes it, Ryan, you, you're, you're on fire tonight. The reason why it doesn't help is because the number trying to evaluate something related to perception and perception is subjective. I mean, yes, yes. I mean, the PPM number exists because it is it is an actual measurement of the peat per, parts per million peating levels of, and, and I, I, I think that's really important, but it doesn't tell you anything about flavor. And that's my main drive home from this. Anyhow, shut up, Marshman. No, I didn't say that, but you can say that if you want. I want to show you actually, I want to show you all a photo of what the actual distillery looks like. So let's just, I'll bring this in on the bigger screen here. There it is. Um, it's a pretty traditional layout, except for the fact that, I mean, you've got fairly sort of like, um, it's actually a fairly slender wash still in the back left there. This, I think it's odd to see the spirit safe so high off the ground. Uh, obviously, they've just got a ladder up there uh, to get up and down from there. But, and, you know, the spirit safe, it, it, if, they're, if they've got any smarts, they would have automated when the cuts are made and everything by now. Uh, but it's in in it's very much an or like very traditional sort of setup. It's a you know a pair of stills and their total output. I think it's a nine hundred and six hundred liter still, and the total output is um, uh, thirty five thousand liters. So not much at all, actually, very very not much at all. Which is uh, uh, something you see quite often in New World whiskey distilleries. Thirty five thousand would be considered a mid sized distillery in Australia. It'd be probably much the same in um sweden anyway let's have a um let's have a taste of this oh that's a big one that's a big one i didn't check 62.7 percent abv for those who've just tuned in sweet kiss from a smoking mermaid a premium selection of a new old distillery out of sweden and a dot one we featured this oh that is a big whiskey i'm gonna have a few drops of water that i think it'll help it out a bit I'll show you what I'm adding, actually. I'll show you what I'm adding so you can see. As a rough guide, I just like to do a sort of a, just a splash, just a splash, bring it down a little bit. When I say a big one, it is big. It's 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 a lot of peat on the palate, actually. Far more on the palate than I was expecting. For those who like our 66s and 16s, especially 66s, I think you'll like this. It's like bacon beach combing and a little bit of seaweed, seaweed and seafood. Like prawns and prawns and bacon. I think I said before it's it's true. Um, Keenan says it's actually very interesting. I thought it may have played a part in how the society categorizes its peter profiles. So it's interesting to know they're not connected. They're not connected, Keenan, and and I nor should they be. Uh, I, I've said before we have placed in the past. We've done things like we've put there was a refill ex bourbon barrel that was recently, this was bottled recently, a refill ex bourbon barrel that was bottled in the deep, rich and dried fruits flavor profile. Just as a, about a year ago, we had a sherry cask, full sherry maturation whiskey that was bottled in the young and sprightly flavor profile. 
flavor profile is not related to any specific aspect of that whiskey, age, cast type, peaking levels, uh, anything like that. It has all to do with the flavor profile of that spirit as determined by the panel. And that panel, as I've talked about before in the past, is uh, constantly being trained, constantly improving, upping their scoring game, training their own palates, working closely with the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute. So there's a lot of science that's going behind it now, which is fantastic. And um, but Keenan, I wasn't sorry. I wasn't actually. I wasn't digging at you at all for that comment because it is very valid. It's it's just that I it's it's off. I find it is co quite often a mistake that we make to fall into that whole sort of like, oh, if it's a sherry cask, it must be deep, rich, and dried fruits, or if it's 120 ppm, it must be peated. Uh, not at all. In fact, there's a peated whiskey coming out soon from us that is in the young and sprightly flavor profile, and it is a peated version of a spirit we don't normally see, which is exciting. So it's from. Pardon me, a distillery we don't often see peated at all. Um, Jesse says, speaking of Pete, there's a certain Isla whiskey community. No, there's a certain Isla whiskey commonly associated with Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec that seems to be skyrocketing in price. I'm speaking only about the 16 year old expression. Anyone know why this may be the case? Jesse, really good question. Let's first of all, I know which just well, we know which distillery you're talking about. Distillery Triple One, yay! Uh, <laughs> the, the, the reason why. Um, you might be seeing that product skyrocket, is because with the exception of Dalwini 15 uh, and maybe Glen Kinchy 12, there's, in terms of the the stocks, I mean, let's be honest, 16-year-old statement on a, a, a core range whiskey to maintain that 16-year-old statement for that length of time and uh, maintain supply of such at a quality level that they're happy with would take a lot of effort. Perhaps I think it's just a case of reduced supply and increased demand. Uh, maybe we can blame Ron Swanson for that. Um, but, I mean, often things will just go through that. It might be just a short supply. We might even be seeing, we might even be starting to see now some of the supply issues associated with maybe casking and maturation from COVID. I don't think we'd see that for a few more years to come, to be honest. So it is what it is. Um, that's, so this this whiskey, this 145 is, with a drop of water, has really just, it's hit its straps a bit. It's fantastic. Curse you, Swanson. I agree. No, Swan Ron Swanson did wonderful things to um to grow awareness of, of Scotch whiskey, let's be honest. Um, the character Ron Swanson did. Uh, and I've heard that um uh Nick Offerman, sorry, camp took a moment. The actor himself is obviously quite a huge fan of Scotch whiskey and a huge fan of um of Distillery Triple One. Um, I'm, it's always good. I mean, people say, uh, "Is it, you know, do you mind that you know Scotch whiskey is often you know associated with things like Mad Men or or suits, you know, where they're drinking Macallan 18 or Mictas or something?" And it's it's like, no, it's great. Um, no, it's not Mictas, is it? They drink Mictas on um, Billions and they drink Macallan on Suits and Canadian Club and Shivers Regal on Mad Men. I'm a huge Mad Men fan. I thought it was a great series, and you know, they I think they're drinking whiskey in just about every scene. Oh wow! It's, it almost gets turned to that um, ash brie with a bit of water. Fantastic. Anyway, whilst I'm enjoying that, and I just want to tell you a little bit about the distillery and a bit about the story of these guys, as I showed the distillery photo before, and a copy, and that was his uh, his book, Enjoying Malt Whiskey. Pretty hard one to find these days. I'd love to read it one day. But um, in the meantime, uh, also. Uh, this actually, this whiskey came uh, on um, in the Christmas advent calendar as well. So, in case you may have got a sample of it there for those who grabbed that pack back, back in December, uh, it's also worth mentioning. Unrelated to, of course, Swedish whiskey, however, but uh, Shirt Bar in Sydney for those who live in Sydney just picked up uh, two of our releases from the February outturn: one one three dot three six honey salad, and um, and of course sixteen dot four six. Texas barbecue brisket. Zoom in on those two. There we can see them there. Two great releases there. So they're at Nen now open and pouring at Sherpa. Great photos as well from the team there. Um, and I think that was that was all I wanted to go over. Really, I mean, I think that's I think that's everything for tonight. Anyway, just a quick live to talk a bit about Swedish whiskey and and take you on a bit of a journey with with what it is with the sweet kiss from a smoking mermaid. It's sweet. It's seafoody. It's fun. It's a, uh, it's it's everything you'd want in a nice long aged, new old whiskey. Eight years old might not be considered very long in a, 
in, in Scotch whiskey. It'd be considered sort of quite youngish in Scotch whiskey, to be honest. But in, uh, in new old whiskey where the climates are different, the maturation is different, and eight years in a first fill, it's held up very nicely indeed. I want to thank you again for coming along this journey, for coming along the journey with the society, for having a taste of it with some great whiskey and having some great discussions. And I love the questions that you guys throw in the comments because not only do I get to answer some of them during the live, but it means I get to go, hey, there's some questions asked in there that I have no idea the answers to that I want to do a bit more research on and bring into another live stream. So I always really appreciate that. Um, Mark Teague asks, are there any more live streams before Friday? Uh, not sure yet, Mark. There might be one on Thursday. So yes. And then thurs Thursday will be almost like an outturn teaser live. And then outturn will be in your inboxes on Friday ahead of the following week's release for March outturn. March outturn is all about game changes. So I'll do a bit of a preview on that on Thursday night. Really appreciate it, Mark. Thank you for asking. And um, looking forward to the 12th in Sydney. Really good point. 12th of Sydney and 12th of Sydney. 12th of March. Friday the 12th of March is our um, is our, uh, our massive Game Changers event in Sydney. Really would love to see as many of you as there as possible. We've got the Macquarie Room back for all ourselves again. We're really looking forward to being back and um, presenting that. Andrew will be presenting that uh, night alongside myself, and we'll, we'll, be, we'll all be there. It's going to be fantastic. Um, we just had an excise hike 1st of February. Yeah, there you go. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Bit of a quick chat about Swedish whiskey and, and about 145.1. I'll have to get Dave Maxwell in. He knows a lot about Swedish whiskey. He's one of our members who knows, I think, more about Swedish whiskey than anyone in Australia. So um, I'd love to get him in sometime. And Keenan asks, are you down for the Melbourne Whiskey Cruise? You bet I am. Alex and I will be there in full fledged uh, boating attire, <laughs> and we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna be bringing a bag full of whiskey. The cruise has sold out, so I didn't need to talk too much about it. The cruise has well and truly sold out. There's a wait list on that at the moment, uh, and there's a lot of events coming up which will be advertised in our March outturn later this week. Thank you again, and I will see you all soon. Take care.